I'll do a, a brief introduction. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our very first uh, Minute Open research event. And uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Dennis O'Hara joining us from NUI Galway. And uh, Dennis's background, research background, is in behavioral experimental psychology, but he's been a proponent of open science for, for years, and he's involved in various initiatives like the Open Scholarship Community in Galway, and been involved with the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences, and various other uh, initiatives. So today he's going to uh, show us the nuts and bolts of the OSF, uh, which I think you'll find is uh, a really uh, flexible and amazing free resource for us to use as we as we will. Um, so I'll leave it to you, Dennis. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dermis, and welcome to you all today. Uh, thank you for coming coming along. Uh, it's uh, a nice bright morning here in in Galway. No, amazingly, it's not raining. I hope you I hope you've got a nice day there for, uh, over in Maynooth. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a uh, I, I am a Maynooth alumnus actually. So this is this is me from from 2002 uh, when I still had hair, and so uh, that's me in the in the beautiful, beautiful gardens of, of uh, NUI, at the time it was NUI Maynooth, whereas now it's Maynooth University. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm that old and, I, and not at all as felt as, a, as it was in, in those days. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk to you today about the OSF. Um, so the open science framework is it just it's a very useful tool. And um, I'm going to talk today about the tool itself and what it can be done. But some background on the tool is that it's run by the organization uh, CAUSE, which is Center for Open Science. I've actually spelled that in the European way. They, they spell it in the American way. I'm a, I'm a CAUSE ambassador, just to, to put that out there. So just you know that, uh, that, that I have that role. So as an ambassador, I, 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 part of what I do is tell people about what how, how, what cause do and 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 how and how help people with using the open science framework and so I, I've always been really impressed by the OSF as, as a tool that just allows us to do so many so many um, functions within our academic workflows our researcher workflows and so what when I introduce OSF, I tend to take in a slightly different direction uh, because I, I really come from a, a researcher perspective first, and that depends. That's you can get you can use the OSF whether you're you know it's your first bit of research you're using for your final your project in psychology or or another scientific discipline, um, or if you're in this, it, it's also flexible in terms of being useful for open scholarship. So it's not even, I, I would say, uh, restricted to, to science. I, 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 you, I often begin this, con this conversation by saying, I'm going to de-emphasize that the open science framework is open and I'm going to de-emphasize that it's for science. So really what I'm going to be talking to you is how as researchers, and scholars, you can take advantage of the OSF as a tool uh, in many different ways, both internally for your internal research practices, but also then externally in terms of communication. And I think communication dissemination, rather than just producing uh, public outputs, because really OSF is a very useful communication tool. And so that's, I think if you think about it in terms of how can I have a framework that's going to help me organize research, uh, whether that's my own research or the research of my, mine and collaborators, whether they're uh, students or other or other um, colleagues? Um, it's it, there, or I think there are many ways you can use OSF. So it's a free open platform to support your research. And OSF, when it was developed, was very much developed with the idea that what would be useful for researchers and then how can re researchers switch on parts of what they're doing to make them public if they wish to. So it's science focused, but it's useful for any open scholarship. I think there's a lot of work to be done in with 
and, and maybe through the library in, in Maynooth, you're already, and with Dermot's more network that you're lo looking to do this. Uh, but here, it, I think there's some brainstorming to be done with uh, the, the less, the, the, the disciplines that weren't traditionally scientific. Uh, so the more scholarly disciplines, let's say like English and uh, French and look, talking to, to researchers in those, uh, scholars in those disciplines about, are there parts of what you do as a scholar that you think would be useful for others? And so they, most of these people are lecturers as well. And they're, they're telling people ab about how to do, do their work as well as the, about the content and what they've, what they've found. And I think those practices, sharing practices, uh, scholarship practices, scientific practices, I think that's really important. And particularly in, open, in, in the, the uh, scholarly disciplines, I think there's a lot there to be gained in terms of both improving scholarship worldwide by communication of scholarly practices, but also in terms of improving the impact of scholars uh, so that scholars can communicate much more of what they do. And uh, because we find uh, that, uh, you know, that often the, the work that scholars do is, is sometimes underappreciated. So my take home message is, we're going to take you from maybe a, coming to this talk with an idea, oh, that OSF thing, I've heard of that before, that might be useful for, for open science or for preprints or something like that, for open scholarship, it might be handy for that. And I'm going to take you from that area, that idea to OSF is a useful project management tool that easily generates open scholarship outputs. Okay, so the easiest way to generate open outputs is to be generate is to have the outputs recorded as you're going through your, your scholarly work, as you're going through your research project. You just use the, the OSF projects as private projects. And then afterwards, you can switch on as much or as little of that project as you wish to share that with others. And the reason I think we start first by, by using it as a, as a private project management tool is that in, in, gen, in generating that, that, uh, that kind of a notebook, like a lab, it's almost like lab notebooks, which are very common, in, obviously already in, in uh, science. In fact, there are a number of OSF projects that, that are used as uh, lab notebooks. If you use OSF as a lab notebook, you can share practices very easily because you're documenting your practices, which are good for you anyway, in terms of being able to look back at what you've done and when you did it. But you also then get the opportunity to share uh, components of that. Say, so, hang on, this is a really nice SOP, um, but I don't know how I could share that in a paper. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna just make this available. And then it's gonna be searchable and findable by other researchers. And so then, so I think uh, we use, if we think about using, OSF first is a project management tool um, that you know that it allows us to easily document what we're doing, to, to, to con uh, and uh, control versions of our work and so on. It's a really it then has these additional open scholarship benefits uh, and they're easier to take advantage of. So I'm going to have a quick look. I, I sent out a, a, a questionnaire to to look uh, to see. Um, of the kind, the the, the uh, of what the attendees would be like. So I got I got four responses, we, and we've got many many more. We've got fifteen people on the call today, so there's many more uh, people who uh, who I haven't filled this in. But just have, I, I'm going to maybe uh, swap my screen just for a second here uh, to share the uh, what I have in terms of my findings. As ever, open scholarship make, making everything of. Oh, it, I just, I find forms, whether you use Google Forms or, or, or MS Forms, a really handy way to, to get a read on a situation. I, I, I use them for meetings, to speed up meetings, where I ask, I ask people, you know, I want your opinion on these three issues, because it's sometimes hard in, in a meeting to get, get, to find out what people really think, especially actually on, on 
on Zoom because it's even harder to have a side, side conversation. But that's that's a, a little tangent there for a second. So I, I really like this. So looking quickly at the attendees who've, who've uh, filled this out, we have a, a broad range. So we, we're going from principal investigators to, to postdocs, to graduate students and to others. So this is really interesting. So that's great that you've got, that people are connecting with more at all of these different levels. So, and that's brilliant. You want to encourage that as much as possible. So if you're a postdoc, bring more postdocs involved, get more postdocs involved. If you're a grad student, talk to your fellow grad students, get them involved. If you're in, if you're, uh, in another function, maybe you're working in the library, talk to other, other library staff about the opportunities and ways that they can include OSF in their training. There are lots of different ways. And of course, PIs know other PIs and can, and can spread the word there and spreading the word down through your labs as well um, is, is, a, is, is really useful. So we've got a broad range. We're looking at cognitive science, oceanography, and let's have a quick look here. Uh, so mostly psychology. That's that's not a surprise because uh, it's like it's funny. OSF was developed or originally to deal with uh, issues in the in the quote unquote replication crisis in psychology. So we tend to so psychologists tend to be more more. It's more common that psychologists are, are aware of open science, but that's not to say that it's obviously limited. Open science is a huge movement now. Um, have you generated open scholarships regularly? Excellent, that's fantastic. So um, that's great to see. So two people have regularly generated one or two. Excellent, haven't produced any. Well, that's that's really that's that's really good because um, it's typically when I'm, when I'm doing these conversations, I'm talking to people who haven't uh, generated open scholarship outputs before, and it's it's a situation where this is all quite new to them. You're already, you've already done these, this, that's fantastic. So hopefully now we'll be able to add maybe a, an extra trick or two to your, or an extra tool to your toolbox. What's your current knowledge of open scholarship? Pretty up to date, excellent, enthusiastic, but want to know more. Don't know anything, best, brilliant. Okay, what do you hope to get out of this workshop? Like to add to the range of options, brilliant. Uh, know how OSF is useful generally, great. Um, and then I'd like to feel like I can get started using OSF right away and then other. So I think that's getting, I want you all to feel like you can use OSF tomorrow or that you can use OSF as soon as, as soon as you complete this talk. So um, let's just do a quick show of hands uh, among the participants. You can use your, um, you can use your responses there. Just have you, have you signed up for OSF? Do you have an OSF account? Okay, a quick look at those. Let's click on the participants here. We have one, two, three. Um, okay. So it might be useful. So I'll just go through the, the setup. Okay, so, um, so let's see now. If I click on to, is this still sharing with you? If I, if yeah, this, I this tab is still sharing, excellent. Okay, so this is my profile here. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, log out. So if you if you turn up to, to OSF, you're gonna see something like this. You click on get started. So uh, to get to OSF, you just type osf.io. Even if you type OSF into Google, you'll, you can get yourself here. Open open science um, if, if, it, if you need a little bit of help. And so you'll, you can get, you'll, you'll find osf.io. Then you click on get started. And then you just fill in your full name, contact email, confirm it, and then pop a password in and you are done. So for those of you who aren't members, if, if I'm at any time, I'm a, I'm a little bit boring, hop on there and just uh, and fill it, fill it out. And you, you'll have an OSF account uh, by, by the end of this talk. So that would be great. And if we have a little bit of time later, and if you're having, if, if you do it and you have any issues, just let, let me know. So I'm gonna sign in. Once you, once you have your own sign in, I just sign in through uh, here. You, you can see it's, you can sign in with ORCID as well, or you can sign in through your institution. 
if you if you're going to use the institutional approach, then I think you have to have your you have to have the OSF institution uh, option. No, we actually looked into that uh, at Anyway Galway, but we were just too late to get it for free. Uh, the early adopters of the OSF institution option got it for free, but we were we were just a little bit too late. So this when you when you open up your uh, OSF, you get your dashboard, and you can create new projects straight from here. And you'll see that uh, I've put a, I've made a, a, an OSF page here for today's talk, and I've added Dermot as a collaborator on that, so that Dermot can know uh, after today's talk if there are you know topics that you want to add to this particular uh, page, you can you can do so easily. So if we click on this, we now have a little web page for today's talk, introduction to the OSF for more. Open Research, March 2022, contributors, me and, and Dermot. And you can click on Dermot here and have a, have a look at all of his work here. So we, we can see definitely Dermot is one of the people who's, who's created, uh, who's produced open outputs before, right? We can see that he's, he's doing that. And so uh, we can click on any of these things are click, clickable. Now you'll notice this says forked from, and forked from means that I used a previous uh, a previous OSF uh, project, and I forked it to make this new project. And I'll, ta I'll talk to you a little bit about that before, but if you want to go back to the original that I used before, I can just click on it here, and you'll see that I did an open, an OSF uh, talk for the OS OSCG in Galway just before Christmas, and I used that as the start for, my, for, this, for, the, for, the Moore, um, for the Moore version, right? And again, I, you can, I can make this, this all, it's all public. Now this, uh, this actually isn't available uh, today, but we can make, uh, that's, I didn't make it public because I didn't have Dermot's permission at the, at, at the time, but we can, we can make that public by the end of the talk. It's actually, it just takes me pressing this button to make it public. Okay, so let's just a quick look around, uh, just a quick introduction to what the OSF looks like. So I'll go back to my, to my, uh, to my slides now. Um, and so here we go. Here we go. So I'll just give a, a small little bit of history for why the OSF uh, was developed. So there was a, in, a, a replication crisis occurred primarily in psychology a number of years ago. And OSF w was developed as part of a number of solutions to this. And so the part of the issues with the replication crisis stem from harking, which is hypothesizing after the results are known, file drawer problem, which is that many, much research uh, never sees the light of day, it remains in file drawers, and low power studies. So low power studies are studies where the probability of, of, of obtaining a significant effect, even with the number, is, is very low given the expected effect size and the number of participants that were actually used. So power, for those of you who may, may not uh, be aware of the term, is just a statistical feature. And so it's, it basically takes into account the strength of an effect in the, in, in the real world, as much as we can uh, guess at that. And then the, when you're going to test for that, you need to uh, use a certain number of participants. And statistics are designed to be conservative so they will they are going to uh, try and prevent type one errors. So type one errors are concluding that there are differences when there are no differences in reality. So if you're protecting for type one errors, you make type two errors, which is not finding not finding effects that, that are actually out there. You make that more likely. So you can use the number of participants you have to increase your certainty that the effects that you're seeing in your sample reflect the population. So power can be is was an issue in many psychological studies, and uh, you know is in any view filled out an ethical, ethics application form, you will have had to do a power analysis because that was a, a sea change really from the, I suppose the, the late nineties two thousands in 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 science. So um, what does OSF provide? Well, it provides pre registration. So when, when people ask about pre-registration, I usually talk about sport because I am very into rugby. I, I love sport. 
and I listened to lots of people talking about uh, talking about sport. And so whenever there's a game at the weekend, Munster playing Leinster, hey, hey, at the weekend, come on, Munster. Uh, so uh, Munster playing Leinster at the weekend, and everybody says before the game what they think is going to happen in the game, okay? And you'll find that people make, you know, make judgments about what's going to happen in the game, and some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Okay? Some people say, oh, yeah, Munster definitely going to win. No, Leinster definitely going to win. And you'll, you'll know some of those people tend to be more based on data. Some will be more based on personal opinion. They always say monster regardless. They always say Leinster regardless. And so, but they will all make some claims about what's going to happen in, in the match, right? And then we have the match. And then afterwards, on Monday morning, everyone thinks that what happened seems much more likely than it, than before it's like oh well yeah yeah of course it happened that way and if you if you just met those met someone on a monday morning and you said you asked them what who did you think was going to win the monster match or the leinster match at the weekend and they will be much more likely to say well wh whoever won and i thought they were more likely to win because it made sense you know because they've seen the match and, and they've they've now seen they've now seen who's won and they can make a very good story about how it was they knew before the match that Munster or Leinster were going to win. So pre-registration is basically writing down and making public beforehand what you think is going to happen in your study. And if you do so, you are much more likely to prevent many problems in, 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 in science. So, and again, if you want to think about that, I, I usually use the kind of Monday morning you know, everyone everyone knew what was going to happen on Monday morning. I used that as, as a way into thinking about the, the issues with harking. Sharing data analysis codes procedures. You'll notice that when I when I started when I started talking about OSF, my belief is that we should be sharing across rather than across our, our work, rather than getting our work to a point of publication and then sharing. We should, rather than having the bulk, you know, the lava come out the top of the volcano, we need to have the lava come out all, all the way through, right? So we need to have not just, because the problem is that an output, even the best paper that, that you will read, you can only learn so much from the, a scientific paper that describes its procedures and describes the result. You can learn so much more if you know about how, if you learn some of the practices that are that went into th into the reality of that uh, of that uh, work. So sharing data, analysis codes, procedures. Um, I, I think procedures are, are really where it's at. And then collaboration. So collaboration. Uh, there are a number. Of, the psychological accelerator is probably the best known of these, uh, where you have numerous. You you use many many labs. Uh, the many lab studies, another one. Uh, many labs work together, use the same procedures. They all agree on the procedures beforehand, and then they all run the same they run the same paradigm in different locations at the same time. That improves the power because you've got more participants, and it gives you a greater certainty into whether the procedures that you're running uh, in your in your location they give rise to the same effects that everyone is getting across the world. You have a much higher certainty in the outcomes that, that we're observing. So th these are all ways that are facilitated through o OSF. So again, what is pre-registration? In the traditional uh, approach of uh, sci this traditional scientific method, you design, collect, analyze, and publish. With pre-registration, you pop in pre-registration between the design phase and collection phase. And pre-registration is simply telling people what you expect to find and what you're going to do and what you expect to find. And there are a number of reasons why this is useful. It increases the value of your, the, the meaning of your p-values. It improves the design because if you have to say what you're doing in detail beforehand and you have to put it up in front of everyone, you're more likely to, make, to do that appropriately. There are lower degrees of freedom for the researcher. The researcher degrees of freedom are uh, is an idea where when you are engaging in research, there are a number of small decisions you make every day that can bias the res your, your outcomes without any intention. And you will be making these decisions. Everyone makes these decisions every day. And 
one of the, the issues that when it comes to to uh, some of the narrative around open science is that is that you know you you have to be the perfect researcher you really do not have to be the perfect researcher there is no perfect researcher out there and if you think that's the level you've got to get to well that's a that's fine that's a wonderful goal to have but if it gets in the way of, of actually sharing your procedures and sharing your work then it is not working for you you need to realize that every researcher is imperfect but what matters is communicating what you're doing so that others can can help you if you're doing some, something that's not not okay but also so that they can benefit from what you're doing right and so um we need and, and often those people who are striving for perfection often have better procedures that could, should be shared more so if you have these worries about being uh, about being perfect i would say don't uh, ease off a little bit on aiming for perfection and instead aim for perfection through communication and collaboration by helping each other we, we achieve per perfection yes it you know there's that feeling of of that we are opening ourselves out we might be you know we're not 100 confident someone was going to respect what we do but that's that's part of part of what once you get used to it it opening up is is, is a much much better way uh, than, uh, than than keeping things to yourself uh, preventing post hoc rationalization that's the monday morning uh you know everything was obvious and reducing harking just hypothesizing after results are known hypothesizing after results are known is running a whole bunch of running a whole bunch of statistical results statistical um procedures finding a significant effect and then writing your introduction as though you were always looking for it okay and that's uh that's not appropriate so pre-registration is an important pro process. It's facilitated by, by OSF. Mm -hmm. um, you can fill in a simple form at OSF. There are a variety of different um, forms that you can fill in that have been developed by diff different uh, groups. Aspredicted.org is, is a very familiar one. Uh, and it makes public, publicly visible registration uh, of hypo hypotheses. Um, I, I'm going to make links to videos on the process on the OSF page for this talk. The reason being, it, there are a few steps to it, so it's much better just to do this when you have, when you're going to be doing it, when you when you are about to pre-register. That's when you need to to read about this and or, or to learn about this. So get it. There's there are videos there. If there's something you'd like to pre-register, work through the video. Take it nice and slowly. Uh, if I tell you now, it's not a, the best use of our time because it, you know, you're you're not going to remember it when you need it. The best time to, to learn this is when you need it. You'll be much more on top of it. You'll have better questions. You'll be able to, you'll be able to and, and then fire off questions to people who pre-registered previously if you're having issues. I will say there's a, a, an opportunity here though. And, and this, this is one of the things you have is an opportunity to build pre-reg into student research. So obviously we, we want to build pre-reg into PhD research but I'm thinking more at the level of undergraduate research. But so in psychology, we have final year theses where students run uh, final year projects, uh, you know, that are typically like a small, small journal, the equivalent of a small journal article. If, you're, if your students are going to collect data for their final year thesis, then they will need to, to usually produce either a research proposal or an ethics application. Typically, at that point, they have enough of the, they have almost all the details they will need for a pre registration. So, at that point, that's a really nice point. The student has done the work, they're thinking about it, they're thinking about is this the right hypothesis? Is that the right hypothesis? Is the power there? They will have done a power analysis for their, for their, uh, for their ethics application. They then can take all of that knowledge and then pre develop a pre-registration and there are tons of advantages for the, the supervisor the student in doing it at that moment now i'm saying that we haven't managed to bake that into our final year project yet here in psychology because everyone's busy right um and but it is still to my mind an open door uh, and it can be certainly computed on psychology. I'm not as familiar with other scientific disciplines, but if they're collecting, if your students are collecting data 
and they need, to, they need to do an ethics application or a research proposal in which they have a power analysis, then they have almost everything they need for pre-registration. Okay, so at that point, I think it's, it's, there's, there are tons of, in terms of the, you have a final year student who has a public, you know, a, it's not a publication, but it's a public demonstration of their ability to, and their understanding of science, if they have a pre-registration. So that is a, a, a moment that's really, I, th I think a moment uh, where, where there's an opportunity in, in, our, in our everyday teaching and working lives to, to bring in pre-registration. And, and every single one of those undergraduate students then knows about pre-registration, they've done it, they value it, and they, can, they will do it just as a, as a default from that point on. So stepping back from, uh, from pre-registration for a moment, what is the point uh, what what are we doing when we're engaging in open scholarship? Well, my my view upon this is that facilitating transparency, communication, and collaboration of all aspects of scholarship, the scholarship process, benefits all of us. That's why I do what I do. Is that transparency, communication, collaboration across all levels? As I said not waiting for that perfect output, get your procedures out there, get your, you know, your lit reviews out there, get everything out there, your, your terms, your understandings, sharing, sharing, sharing is going to benefit all. It allows individual scholars to increase their impact and the, the, the awareness of them, their literature and their findings, okay? So for you personally, there's an edge in terms of being out there and talking about your work. Institutions increase their visibility because if you're visible, they're visible. And that increases their impact because you're communicating to the public, okay? Taxpayers receive better return on investment because all of our work is paid for by the taxpayers. And if the more impactful our work is, the better return they're getting. We share best practices from every step of scholarship. That means that if there's somebody in India who has nailed a, 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 an approach has nailed a particular scientist, new way of presenting, uh, let's say, visual stimuli uh, that are that are particularly nicely controlled for looking at decision confidence. They've developed it in India. They share it through OSF. Everyone in the world, I can be using it tomorrow in Galway, right? And I always think about Galway in particular, but Ireland in general. We're kind of at the edge of things. Through OSF, we can be in everybody's living room. It, it, you know, someone in the Max Planck Institute in Germany can be reading your, your procedure tomorrow if, if it's on OSF, right? Otherwise, how do you get in front of that person? You would never get in front of some of these really powerful researchers. Somebody in Stanford is looking for a, a way to do something and you have it up on OSF. They don't, they don't care where it comes from. They just, they will know if it's good and they will use it if it's good. And that, that, that is, uh, my belief is we want to get our work out there at all levels. Again, very soapboxy about that sometimes. And then that, all of this makes solutions to worldwide challenges more likely. Right? The more good, clever people are working together, the better we can, the more likely we can change the world and, and improve it for the next generation. So how does OSF help? Let's get to the practical side. So OSF is a free open platform to one, support your research and two, enable collaboration. Okay, so to support your research, we use OSF as a project management tool. That is, we look at ways in which we can think about the projects we're working on and the deliverables we need to produce and then pop it into OSF in a, and use that structure so that we can visually see where we're going. We have a, a place to, to, to store versions of, of, the, of the deliverable uh, and, and the, and the, and the um, components of that deliverable. And the idea is we start private. You you, an OSF project is never has to go public. Just use the tool, get comfortable with using the tool, benefit from the tool. And if you have the option to, to produce a public output, do it when it makes sense. 
right? It, you will know when it makes sense because you know when you've done something that, hang on, that would be useful to share with people. And I honestly think it, it, that serendipitous generation of public outputs is, is, much, is much better because we, we know what matters to researchers like ourselves. And if you think it's good for you, then share it. And because again, it's a way for people to learn that you're doing this work in Maynooth and they, they might never learn of it otherwise. Because even if you get your paper out and you, and you, and you do a great job, that will be, take two or three years to, to, to get there. Maybe another two or three years to have the impact you'd like. And still they won't know the procedure. They, you know, they, won't, they won't know the procedure. They'll, they'll still have to guess at the procedure. They might bring you over to their lab at that point to learn about the procedure, right? That could have happened six years ago. Uh, and then the next part is enabling cooperation and dissemination. So OSF projects, I think, work really nicely as a project website. Okay, so and many of you, if you have a funded project, you will, com you will com commit to having a, a way, a, a means through which the public can be aware of your project and know what's going on. Okay, so they can know, okay, so this is a project funded by EPA, for example, it's looking at climate change um, and, and, you, you want, and, and you've got, these are your outputs. And you know, EPA or SFI will ask you to have a, a website that you can do that. Now, developing a website will take some time and they're easier to do now, but you're going to need to have, you're, you might want to get a sexy, uh, URL for it, you'll have to pay for that. Can you build that? Can you maintain it? How would someone find it? Would they understand it? If you use an OSF project as, as a project website, it's already in the language of OSF. So anyone on OSF already knows the language of OSF. They know where th how to, how to in interact with the, a project on OSF. If you've tagged it appropriately, they found it through OSF. So you, you can, it's a very much more effective way of getting a project dissemination. And I think using OSF projects as project websites is a really useful, useful um, approach. Um, so, um, and I think you can do this for, you don't have to have a funded project for this. You, um, I think, but if you're doing a final year project or you're doing a, let's say a final year dissertation project or you're doing a PhD project particularly, I think is that you can have your lit review, you can have co other components like studies in there. It's, it, it's all very uh, accessible. So this is actually a template for a four-year four -year PhD project that uh, I, I developed with Jerry Malloy here in the department. And we just put it together. There's nothing to this really. I mean, this is not, whoa, look how good, good we are. But again, part of what I want to show you here is don't, uh, this isn't perfect, but I think it's an idea that someone might, might find useful. So rather than getting it perfect, rather than having it be really impressive, let, let's just have it out there. Let's, have, let's see what, if someone else might come up, might develop this, fork this project and turn it into an even better project. And that's just great for science. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not really, I don't care who changes the world. I just want to be part of it. Um, it's not. It's not down to me. I don't want to be Dennis O'Hara changed the world. TM. It's the world is improving. I was part of that. I know I was part of that. Um, so we've got a project structure. So the way that you build the project, you can have components, and then those components have other components. I'll show you that in a little bit of a visual display in a minute. You immediately have version control. So you put up a version. If you put up a, a file with the same name, it will be version two of that pro of that of that. And so you can then go back to the previous version if you need to and so on. Really handy. You can control, uh, ver version control means that if you're working on a, on a, on a document at the same, it, it won't let someone else take out the same document and work on it at the same time. That's really, really useful. It's particularly useful if the bigger your collaborations get. Uh, you know, if you're working on something and somebody makes a change and you're like, Hang on, we now have two different versions of the same project. What's going on here? Uh, if you have if you have Word documents that end with final and final two, uh, and honestly, it's the final document, 
you you, you know what I'm talking about. You, you're you're always version control. It's much easier to just deploy. You, you can. There are many ways you can use version control, but OSF has it built in, so it's really handy. Drag and drop, upload. It's really easy to use. Uh, commenting, you can comment on on, on different sections in, inside in the in the project. You record the contrib contributions. So you just if if someone's going to work with you on a project, you just add them on, and then they, if if someone's you, you send people then cite the project, and then they the authors then are part of the are, are part of the project. You can have contributors who are not authors as well if you need to. I, uh, I haven't needed to have that in my own projects, but uh, they, not all your your contributors have to be authors. And then there are a number of add-ons. So if you've got if you're going to be using, let's say, Dropbox or GitHub, it's a little bit tricky for OneDrive. I'm guessing you you might be using OneDrive for for some of your uh, storage. OneDrive is a little bit tricky. Um, I found at least, uh, but you can connect. Uh, you can connect a OneDrive folder or a Dropbox folder into OSF uh, and then just use, continue to use your OneDrive folder as you would have, but it uploads them, it, it, it's connected to, uh, to OSF so that if you want to become open at any point, again, you just switch it on. And then you can add a license or a, a DOI. So a DOI, just a, a digital uh, object identifier, so to, or an identifier that will be there so that everyone will know what it is in the future. Um, and the license, you, you will typically, if you want to use this, use a, a C, one of the, what are called CC BY licenses, uh, and you can look into those. So if you, if you want to restrict, for example, commercial use, you can, you can do that if you wish. So OSF is a tool. It starts off with one, pro one project, and then you add components. Each of those components is basically another project. And then you can add components to that. And you can see how that might be, you might be starting off with your PhD, and then you've got your lit review. Uh, maybe you've got a, a set, two, a two different topics in your lit review, and you, you, you pop up different uh, sections of it or chapters of it. Uh, and then here we have our first study. We've got our procedure. We've got We've got our, our data analysis. We've got uh, another, we've got um, maybe a data analysis that didn't work out, and we just we just left it there. We we moved on to a different data analysis. Um, here we have an, our, another study, and another study, and then afterwards, what we decide then is I'm going to make my my lit review the the preprint and and the and the uh, and the searches. I'm going to make that open access. But out of this, I want to go. I, I, I'm going to make my data, the first data analysis and the procedures from study one. I'm going to make them available as well. And my the data analysis didn't work out. I'm not going to make, make them available. I don't think there's really much to be, be gained by showing people that it was, didn't really work out. It wasn't a, a, a useful approach, um, and so on. So again, you just make a call as to what you think is going to be of use to other scientists. So you set up your project, you add components for sub-projects, sub and then you add collaborators on the relevant components. So you might have a situation where this study, uh, you, you introduce a new collaborator because uh, there was a, a new topic. Uh, it it, it bridge, bridged onto, uh, let's say, it became interdisciplinary um, as, uh, as you were working on it. And so you can add that collaborator to this component, but they don't have to be on everything. Uh, they don't even have to be on the subcomponents. Uh, so, uh, and then you make relevant uh, components uh, public. So, uh, you can then use OSF as a project website. This is one that we have for one of our uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, David Kanasa. He's looking at expression of nonverbal behaviors in video interviews and trying to see can we infer personality from how people move while, while they're being interviewed, particularly their face and their facial um, facial movements. And so we, uh, David, have put the, the website together. Again, one of the things about OSF is it's so easy to use. It's not a situation where you learn it and then you become tech support for everybody, right? That's not how it works. That's what that's what happens with a lot of you know good new stuff. It's like, oh, hang on, oh. You know that you're tech support now, right? And it's like it, 
you get punished for expertise, okay? It's like, oh, hang on a second. Nobody in the department knows how to use uh, R. You know how to use R. So here are 14, 14 students or 14 projects. Now you've got to solve all these problems, right? That's not how OSF, OSF is designed to be used by anybody. There, an, uh, there's an undergraduate student will have no problem using it, probably use it better than most of us because they're digital natives, right? They, it, it's, it, there is a way of doing things. Once they figure out, figure it out, no problem. Duck to water, and then and then they take ownership of it. And again, part of part of the whole open science idea is let's get the ownership, let's pass that ownership on. You know, let's let's not be holding on to ownership. Let's pass it on and and have our students and other researchers gaining their ownership, and then they push it on, uh, and and they get the impact, and then we benefit from. From their coattails rather than rather than the other way around. So there's an editable wiki, so that's really handy. You just you'll see it in 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 the uh, more uh, the more network uh, page that we've put together for for this talk. The project structure is built in. Again, that makes it easy if someone reading your coming a researcher coming to your pro your project wants to know what's going on. Straight away, they know the, the language of OSF, so they know where things are going to be. And again, the add-ons are useful. And really important to use the tags for discovery. So uh, uh, during the pandemic, I was scouring OSF for, for open data sources because we couldn't collect data in our, in our psychology labs. So what happened was, if, if there were public data sets, that were well tagged for discovery, we use them and then we cite those people. So you know, it, it immediately becomes a, a means a means of your, of of research impact. So uh, a project website, as I say before, building your website, building it in a way that others can use it. Yes, you know, there are really useful tools like Wix and others that are out there at the moment that make nice flashy flashy websites. They're not always the best websites for researchers who are interested in your work to either find or use. Um, and then they all require maintenance. Again, OSF is very, very low maintenance. You don't need to worry about, about the URLs. You don't need to worry about anything. It just, it's just, just does what it needs to do. It's not as flashy as having, you know, beautiful, a beautiful website. And if your job, if you're, if you, if you want to promote yourself, OS, an OSF project isn't use, isn't doesn't do that. If you want to promote your work, then OSF is very useful. So um, think of how would you display a project on a website for people to really get it? You'd have to invent it, and then it's going to be different from website to website. So uh, and if you want some evidence of that, go go to any of those EU websites that are developed for EU projects. And it's I find them impossible to, ma to, to navigate because every project, they be look beautiful. And I'm on some of those projects and, I, and they're good projects. They look beautiful, but it, it's really hard to find where the different components are and, and, and what's being shared. So one of the concerns that comes up when people think about OSF is GDPR. So for those of you who don't know GDPR, GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU. And we we're very we want to take care, make sure that that our participants' data in particular are used appropriately. So, Centre for Open Science provides specific help on privacy and GDPR. Now, CEO Cause is a, is a, an American company, so they 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 don't like, but they provide make. Uh, if you're setting up your WhatsApp project, you can set up where you store the data. And so you can set up to store your data in, in the EU. It's no problem, really straightforward to do. If you're concerned at all about GDPR, re read this section. It'll be as everything will be on the OSF page for this talk, so that you can click into it quickly. If data is going to be public, it will, it will be anonymous, right? Now you need to make sure it is anonymous, all right? That's another, you know, you need to be careful uh, for example, if you are collecting data, this, this happened in our site department, and I was like a real, I, I said, we can't collect age anymore 
as a number if we're using our psychology students. Why? Well, because if you're 43 years old and it's a reasonable expectation that the data were collected from the psychology, from psychology students at NUA Galway, there are not going to be very many 43 year old psychology students. And that means that by accident, we've made someone identifiable. So we need to be really careful about anonymity. Once you are careful about anonymity, anonymous data is actually not subject to GDPR um, if, it, if it is properly anonymous. But we typically, try, we, we, we usually will use most of the GDPR um, guidelines, even if we are using anonymous data, uh, because it's kind of a, we're being conservative and being careful. OSF provides storage in the EU, but it is not encrypted at rest. So if you want, if you want to ensure that your data are encrypted, uh, then you're going to have to encrypt it yourself. Okay. Now, if you're making data public, that's not an issue. But if you're using a private, if you're using OSF privately, and you're concerned that you don't want someone to be able to inadvertently uh, get access to those data, then you, you, you can encrypt it before you put it on OSF. You can encrypt it before you put it on the OneDrive or whatever. Um, uh, in fact, if it is on OneDrive, it's encrypted at rest. So, so that's not an issue. OSF storage itself is not encrypted at rest, but your own, uh, if, you're, if you have a, a, an add-on, then that may well be encrypted at rest. So encrypted at rest means that when the, the file that's being stored, wherever it's being stored in a data center is not stored as an encrypted file, right? En and en encrypted in transit is when the data is going from one point to another, is it going from one point to another using a, an encryption? So uh, it is encrypted in transit because it's used what's called SSL encryption. So you have, that just means that there's a, when data goes from point A to point B on the internet, it's, it's, it's garbled, it's given, a, it's given a key at the start and a key at the end that ungarbles it at the end. So, but when it's stored, at, when it's at rest, it's not encrypted on OSF storage. But again, if it's public, it, does, it doesn't need to be encrypted. You won't want it to be encrypted. So my, my, my thinking here is you plan for public. And I, I always include in, in, my, in, in my participant information, I, we would like to use these data for future, for, for, we would like to make these data, your data, available for, for future scientific use. Are you okay with that? And you and make it's absolutely it's a separate step from consent. It's a, a separate and non conditional um, tick that they put in a box. Yes, I'd like to have this uh, to be used uh, for by future scientists. Or, or, and if they say no, it's fine. We just it's easy. It's a tag that we just eliminate that that line from our data. That individual always has control over their data. Um, in terms of uh, it has control of, the data, of whether those data will be made public. Um, so make participants aware of the intention to generate the data and allow them to exclude their data during consent without it being a, hey, you can't get into my study unless you consent kind of thing, right? We're not, that's not what this is about. It's like, look, we'd love you to take part in our study. We'd also love to give you, to have your data be used by future scientists. What we've, what we've, find, and again, it's a, it's a, this is common, not just in NOA Galway, but across the world, is that most of our participants want their participation to matter. These are volunteers. They are doing so typically because they want to learn about science. They want to participate in science. They care about science changing the world. Uh, in, and so they are on board for that. So typically, it actually increases uh, the, we rarely have people exclude themselves and it, inc it increases the sense of integrity that the students have. And again, our, and often students, but our participants have. So our participants like that we're up, up, above board with them. They like the idea that they, cont they contributed in Galway, but somebody in Berlin or Harvard could be, could, could be using their data. They like that idea that they can contribute to that worldwide that World Wells in initiative, they really, they really like that. So I'm coming up to uh, 11 o'clock now. 
we're, we do have plenty of time for questions, but I'm gonna come back to my take home message. So my take home message is OSF might be, where I've hopefully taken you from, hey, that OSF thing might be handy for my research to OSF is a project management tool that's really handy. It works in my research. If once I adjust my research workflow, there are a number of benefits to, to this. And it has the additional benefit of generating open scholarship outputs. So next steps, I'm gonna show you the, uh, the website and, uh, and then we can, Dermot, if you're okay with it, we'll make it public and then you'll be able to, to find it and uh, yourselves um, after, uh, and we'll just go through that whole process. So on this, we'll have the slides for the workshop. We'll have links to other resources, introduction videos, and example projects. So one of the things we that I find useful is looking at you know a, a project someone else has done and saying, oh yeah, my, that's like my project. I could, I could I could take advantage of that. that that's that's a that's a good idea there. So having a model is, is always handy. So we, we've included some uh, example projects. Um, and what what we might do, Dermot, is if you if you've got some projects that you think would fit in these in these uh, in, in under these categories, um, then we'll replace the ones that I have there with with Maynooth ones, and that'll just give a little bit more of a sense of of you know Maynooth ownership of 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 this particular of this particular page. And then the other thing I'm, I, I've been talking to to Dermot and 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 to the library um, personnel about is potentially creating a, a more network OSF resources page. So uh, a page where this talk would be a resource. Uh, you might have links to the links to library resources that are particular to Maynooth. Um, you might have then another set of resources that are not particular to Maynooth, but but that you add to. And so uh, I'm, I'm I'm hopefully going to be one of many talks that would be available on on, on a on a central um, OSF resources page. So. Uh, I'm just going to now share uh, the OSF page again. We'll go to Brave here. And so, Dermot, are we good to, to make public? Yeah, go for it. Uh, okay, so we, I'm going to break some champagne over the side of this. And we will launch the... Uh, intro so I don't know if the, the warning pops up. It just tells you, hey, this is going public. And, and so that's now public. So. Now anybody in the world can find this. And any of you who use, uh, I'll, just, I'll just pop the link into the chat so you can use it. Uh, here you go. So you can click on that and you can, and you can go straight to the page and, and, and see it. You'll see here we have introduction. We've got a little description. Um, notice here, what I tend to do in this little description, I say, read more on the wiki below, right? I always try and get, Try and get them where you want them to go. Against uh, so um, here we have the the wiki, and you'll notice here I've got the, the wiki will always provide little, almost like an abstract. You can you this is good to you you want to get your main points ahead here, uh, so that read more becomes attractive, and then they'll click on it. So if we get across that it's materials and links, it's just who I am uh, if that's interesting, and then mentions Dermot. Oh. Let's find out more. And so here we go in, and this is the wiki then. We have a number here. We have Dermot, limit, limit, this, uh, Dermot set up more, or help set up more, sorry. Didn't want to be, <laughs> you, again, this is gonna all be edited. This is, wasn't written by Dermot, just in case you th anyone thinks he's taking credit for some. This is all by me, uh, sorry. Uh, and so, this, and this will all be editable by Dermot. And, and if you want to add anybody else, Dermot can add people directly to this um, to this uh, page. If you want to learn more, then we're, uh, we have this. I had this little read more above, but we, uh, there, but we can, you can manipulate that. Uh, so here we have some resources. So here are links to the knowledge base for open scholarship. Again, broadening beyond open science, I think is really important. This is a YouTube uh, video about that. Um, then we've got some introduction videos, again, because it'll be nice to go back and have a video. You'll have this video, but you might have an, you might want a more hands-on video. Some really nice hands-on videos here done by Cons. Um, 
and a number of those here. OSF for research projects. Here are some useful OSF projects. So um, this is bringing OSF into your daily practice. The nice introductions are useful. Uh, we have an OSF introduction, and this is one for psychology. Here are examples of project types. So no frills data hosting, uh, registered report, systematic review, uh, a funded project. This is a nice one, actually. It's, uh, you can see, so this is a funded project, identifying and addressing circular social determinants of adherence to physical distancing, right? So we have in here, we have all of the contributors and you have the work packages. So, okay, work package one was a quantitative study. Work package two was a qualitative study. Work package three was a content analysis. And notice we have the overall project has these contributors, contributors, and then the work packages have different contributors, right? There's a no, so it's really handy way that I, I know like I, if this is a very useful back back end for a funded project, okay? Um, and you can just if you want to learn about this project, go here, just. Um, and if it's got a DOI if it needs to be cited and so on. Um, so a, a lab example, how to use OSF to structure your lab projects. So this is one from the Center for Open Science. And again, this is uh, lab documents, lab meetings, research. So if you've got your, you know, uh, you've got students in, as, as a PI, you may have lab meetings, then you can have all of your, your lab meetings up here. Um, and so on. So there are some, and then here's some useful information. So licenses, guide to licenses, version control, storage caps, uh, connecting OneDrive. It's tricky. Just be careful with that. It's, it's, it's a tricky one using OneDrive. OneDrive. Uh, security and privacy, uh, data management plans. I haven't mentioned, but OSF is very useful as part of a data management plan. For any of you who are submitting funding proposals, you will have to have a data management plan. And even if you don't, it's good to know about them. Um, if you're doing, say, if, uh, you're a PhD at the moment, learning about data management plans would be very, very useful for you going forward in your career. Uh, making a data dictionary. So it's important if you're going to share your data that someone could understand what your columns stand for. So there's a useful data dictionary um, resource here. And then this is uh, metadata standards. So uh, again, if you're giving, if, if you're going to provide data, uh, what are the metadata? That is the data about the data that you're providing. And so um, this is uh, the CSV one, which is a common one. I, I, it's one that I use a lot. So, so that's why I popped it up here. And again, this is this is just what we have at the moment. Uh, and Dermot has only just seen, you know, just seen this since last night. So we, we'll be. This is going to be developed. Um, as as we go again, the nice thing about OSF is it's 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 organic. It's always growing, right? A project is always can always be added to. I've also added in here a template for a four-year PhD project. So IRC uh, and uh, and a lot of funders fund four-year PhD projects in Ireland, and so we thought you know let, let's just put a template together. And it's re it's just it's not even a template really, it's just a play. It, it's almost showing you a template as possible, because you just take this template, and I've got a little bit of a blurb down here. You'll see, click read more to find out. And so I have a little bit of blurb down here about what you put where, and so you can you can move a lot, you can go through that. But the idea here would be, you provide your little a, a little synopsis description. I would use this little template here. This section here would be your abstract. And then you add in some, some studies. Uh, so that's an example. You just fork that project and off you go. And it, it's all yours. Just take, take it and go. It doesn't, um, um, and that's hopefully going to be handy. So that's that. I need to go back to here. OK. So we have that. I think that is everything I was going to cover. So uh, anybody, any questions?